This is, this is so moving. It's so great that you're all here. Carla, thank you. President, how um, do I call you Joseph? Yeah. Uh, Joey. Joey. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> well, your, your remarks really uh, move me very much. And I've had the great good fortune. Um, let, let me go slow, slowly. I, I'm, I'm not used to being on a panel. So I have only six minutes. Um, I know you'll cut me off. It's not <laughs> um, but the whole issue of why biography and memoir are what are selling and what folks want to read is really interesting in this moment of tragedy and turmoil and confusion and unwellness on so many levels. And I think it is that folks really want to know how did they do it? How did they survive? How did they get past it? And um, that's really a very basic issue for all of us who write lives. Now, I didn't start out writing lives. Um, actually, I started out as an athlete, and I had an accident. Um, and I. Uh, a boy put a barbell at the end of a mat as I came out of a triple flip. Oh. Whereupon oh. Oh I broke every uh, muscle and ligament in my back. Whereupon I couldn't go to the Olympics. Whereupon I couldn't major in phys ed. Whereupon oh, I had to take other courses. <laughs> <laughs> so I majored in every course I took history. <laughs> and political science, and I went to uh, graduate school. My life was an accident. I went to the graduate school that gave me the most money, which was Johns Hopkins, and I was the first woman in the program, and it was in international relations, and I was going to be a military historian. <laughs> and then the war in Vietnam started, and it was 1962, and I was Owen Lattimore's last U.S. student. How's that for an accident? Mm. And I was his assistant to help him pack up. Anyway, I, I really was very lucky. And then we founded something called, well, it's now called the Peace History Society. And I changed my dissertation from a military history dissertation to a peace history dissertation. And I found an organization called the American Union Against Militarism, which becomes the ACLU. <laughs> Um, and so I interviewed a man named Max Eastman, who said, you know, you should really uh, know about my sister, Crystal Eastman, who really was the lawyer who founded the ACLU. Anyway, I said essentially, and I have all her papers, her papers to her lovers, her papers to her husbands, her papers to me and our mother. And I said, no, thank you, because God help me. That was about lives, and I was interested in war, hard, hard history. Um, it took me many years to get over that, but the women's movement changed our lives. And the bottom line is, I was very lucky. I was at a syndicated column out of the LA Times. I mean, LA is right here. And um, in 1972, I wrote a column. Uh, saying real conservatives should vote for George McGovern, the true heir to Eisenhower's foreign policy. <laughs> and the president of Doubleday called me up and said, hey, would you like to write a book about Eisenhower? And I said, no, but call my agent. And I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent said, hey, kid, <laughs> you don't hang up on the president of Doubleday. <laughs> um, so we had dinner, and then I went to Abilene, Kansas. Now, I always tell my graduate students, really choose the place you're going to study mm -hmm. by what, what, where the papers are. Abilene was a dry town. <laughs> <laughs> you could not get wine with dinner. Um, I managed, I made friends with the local sheriff. <laughs> He had single malt in his <laughs> But this process, everything I wanted to see was classified, secret. And I grew up in the Bronx. I always say, never go anywhere without your gang. So I went back to New York, and I called up some friends. And I said, everything is classified. Everything is secret. 
We can't find out what happened in Guatemala in 1954. We can't find out what happened in Iran in 1953. We can't find out anything worth knowing. And so we founded something called the Fund for Open Information and Accountability. Bella was in, Bella Abzig was in Congress. We had the Sunshine Law and the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, Claire Koss, my partner, um, was, is, it's really nice to be connected to somebody who's both a psychotherapist and a playwright. <laughs> <laughs> you really get a lot of help uh, thinking about not only the connections. But the bottom line is after 10 years I wrote in my journal, I've now spent most of my vital youth with one dead general. <laughs> <laughs> now that book was a very important book. It is still a very important book. But it led to, it was another accident. Friends sent me uh, books to review while I was lonely and miserable in dry Abilene. <laughs> and one of the books was about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Lorena Hickok, written by a silly woman who would read these love letters and say, these letters couldn't possibly mean what they seem to mean. <laughs> because Eleanor Roosevelt was a saint and a mermaid. <laughs> and uh, it couldn't possibly be. Anyway, um, I wrote a very mean review of that book, and people started to say, why don't you write about it? And then I called up my friend Joe Lash, and I said, let's have dinner, because Joe was my friend. He, he blurred my Crystal Eastman book. This book should stay in print forever. Yeah. So you get to be friends with somebody who <laughs> <laughs> does that for you. And, and I said, you know, Joe, you don't even mention this woman. What's up with that? And he said, I hated her. Why don't you do it? And I said, no, you know, I don't do that. I do military. <laughs> he said, you know, you're wrong. Yeah. And Joe Lash took me to the FDR library and showed me what he didn't do. Um, and what he didn't do was very interesting to me because Joe was Eleanor Roosevelt's very best young friend. Um, and he, anything she said, he said. Anything she didn't say or didn't deal with, he didn't deal with. Mm. And she said, for example, I didn't, I don't care about power. <laughs> and so he wrote, Eleanor Roosevelt didn't care about power. <laughs> so I knew there was a story that I could tell here. And we had a lot of conversations about it, and um, I thought I could finish it in about two years. I signed the contract in 82, the centennial was 84, but I was wrong. Um, as I say to my students, you know, enjoy the process. <laughs> <laughs> but Eleanor Roosevelt, the journey with Eleanor Roosevelt is really marvelous. And I really want to respond to what the president said about two things. You said that we have made ourselves irrelevant by deconstructing. And I absolutely agree with that. I, when I hear, heard the word, in the, it's now over. <laughs> but I would say every time I hear the word deconstruction, I reach for my gun. <laughs> you know, I would really say She that. went through security downstairs. <laughs> I left my gun downstairs. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, that we allowed conversations to be hijacked, especially conversations about religion and spirituality. And when you're working on somebody like Eleanor Roosevelt, spirituality, which I define as a direction of the heart, is really the centerpiece for her of the story. Because she travels the world asking people, tell me, what do you want? What do you need? And that is her commitment. The other part of the story that we allowed to go, and but, but I want to say that we didn't allow it to go because there are people like Howard Zinn and a people's history. And, and that's my textbook. You take my course, it's called Violence and Social Change because I teach cops. They wear guns to class. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but we have, there are no tests. They keep a journal. They read commondreams.org. That's, you know, everybody on commondreams.org. Write it down. <laughs> it is the most progressive news from around the country and around the world, all on one site. It's time to stop. No, okay. you have three. Three minutes. All right. The other thing, Carla's introduction, where are we now? Where are we now? We see where we are after Katrina. We see where we are during that disgusting health care um, process in which we exhibited the fact that the U.S. is practically alone when it comes to economic and social rights and outlaw nation. We are the only industrial country without a national health care program. And if you look at old Europe, sometimes I call it Southwest Asia, or I mean Northwest Asia, <laughs> Northwest Asia. If you look at those countries, there's no homeless crisis and it is still possible to get a college degree for free in places like England, France, and Germany. How does it happen that in the United States we have, it's really kind of the only promise we made to the future, we do public and public higher education. How does it happen that we have retracted that promise so that schools are closing all over the country, public schools, and we have a crisis, a, a true crisis of learning. <clears throat> there is an organization that I want to talk about, NESRI, the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, which exists to put the economic and social rights covenant on the U.S. agenda. The United States has never ratified, even discussed, the Economic and Social Rights Covenant of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is now on the agenda, and Paul Farmer, who spent so much time in Haiti and is here in the Boston-Cambridge area, when he's not in Haiti, is on the board of that, as are many folks that you know and love. So we have a future to fight for. Thank you.